What's going on, everybody? It's Frito here for your Overwatch. The Overwatch League Season 3 kicks off February 8th, this Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. That should be tomorrow at the time of recording. And to get you caught back up with the league today, I'm going to discuss my power rankings for all 20 teams. A lot has changed, tons of roster moves, and as well, of course, an entirely new format, Hero Pools, here to shake up the meta, which should make this year unlike any other before. Power rankings have always been tricky for the Overwatch league because you never know what meta you're going to get ahead of time. The first two seasons had very different play styles, so different they were essentially two different games. Goats was like a MOBA and Dive was more like a shooter and with Hero Pools in Season 3 we're likely to see a mix of all the Overwatch elements get playtime at some point. This means a team will have to be far more well-rounded to see success, a much different format than the meta comp mastery of previous years. Although both styles will likely be key in season three i take the performance from year one to be slightly more weighted than year two as i'd say many of the extreme teamwork comps are likely to be targeted to be nerfed before they even gain momentum as jeff kaplan has basically flat out said that they're going to be nerfing teamwork based playstyles in favor of more individualistic play which i take to mean fps skill shots which was more akin to the season one meta i don't think it'll be so drastic that we'll never see MOBA elements be strong in the game, but it's just something to consider. With the game patching more quickly and hero pools coming in anyway, I think it's likely that it's going to be difficult for teams to hide behind lower skill cap heroes for long. One more note before we start, I did not take travel, number of homestands, or the cancelled games in China into consideration at all. Maybe we will find that these things do matter, but until we have enough data to prove there indeed is a home field advantage, like there is in regular sports, I'll assume it's more neutral and not judge it one way or the other. You do get more practice time when playing at your home and of course a home crowd amping you up, but being the home team, you always play twice on your hosted weekends, whereas some traveling teams get to play once. I've yet to hear anyone make this argument, so maybe this doesn't make sense for some reason, but I think there's a chance that it would be better to be the type of team that gets opportune bye weeks or a convenient single game week than perhaps be a team with, let's say, five homestands. But I'll admit, I haven't studied the schedule deeply to see if this could even be the case. But perhaps if you were to play two strong teams in one week at home, would you have rather that to be rescheduled to play them one at a time so you can focus on each one individually but have to travel? Seems like a trade off, and I'm not sure which which one would be more beneficial. I suppose it depends on how much new prep you would need, but again, all of this seems a little bit too hard to quantify, but probably is something we should be judging as the league goes on this year. With all that put aside, what I more heavily weighted on was based on my assumed strength of the rosters on paper from my experience from watching these players translated to fit into a hero pool rotation format and the new balance philosophy of Blizzard, which should incentivize peak performers as well as strategical depth and flexible players. Kicking it off from the bottom, we're going to start at the C slash D tier. These are teams that I think are unlikely to make a shot at play-ins. Many of these Rosters are either inexperienced or underpowered at key positions, or perhaps have weak depth, which is something that will be crucial come hero pool rotations. I'm sure a portion of them will get their act together for a stretch in the season and grab some unexpected wins and be in C tier, but either way, I expect for playoffs to be out of reach for these squads. Starting it off with number 20, Boston is the one team that seems to want to wheel and deal to develop players for sale rather than dish out cash to win now. Season 1, this looked to work, but perhaps that had more to do with their coach, Krusty, whose departure to the shock was painfully felt in Season 2. This year's roster does little to upgrade the uprising from last year and look to likely suffer from similar problems as before. Their new flex support, Myungbong, is highly regarded, and if Boston has proven anything, they've got a knack for spotting fragging flex supports like Neko and Aim God before him. Other than that, though, the roster feels budget. Fusions is a crowd favorite for sure, I love his play personally, but is only really elite at Reinhardt and shot calling. Both look strong for Uprising in an abysmal Season 2 at times, yet still proved to not be enough to carry this team to consistent victories as it was clear the cast around him was lacking. 
With hero pools in the mix, fusions will be out of his comfort zone and stretch thin, which also goes for most of this roster. Munchkin and Color Hex have looked competitive on their best heroes, but in a hero pool format, you can't hide your team's lack of depth as easily, and this all combines for another rough year for Boston. Number 19, London Spitfire. The London Spitfire have dropped all the players you know and have filled the roster with rookie Korean players. Whereas the inaugural season, they picked up two championship rosters. This one looks a lot more, let's say, meticulously assembled or perhaps a bit frugal. Many of the names are complete unknowns and have only experience in weak regions or smaller tournament scenes. The highest profile players are Glister, who was a legit powerhouse. He's one of those fearsome flex DPS that can take over a game on any hero, a Prophet or Fleta Light archetype, if you will. Look to him to never leave the stage and be a make or break player for this team. But the high skill doesn't go too deep after that. Bernard is a strong player. He was quite the playmaker on the dominant Fusion University team that dominated NA contenders. So I think he's a proven off tank for sure. But at that time, off tank only meant D.Va. So who knows how he stacks up today. Other than that, really, I don't think anyone knows what to expect of this team. Perhaps this ragtag group of fresh faces is locked and loaded to compete with the big dogs but more likely i think this is a rebuilding year for london and they will look to find a core among these players to build off of for next year and drop the rest i feel safer keeping them super low until they prove themselves but for all i know i may be radically off base with this one as i have nothing to go on number 18 paris eternal paris was a team that scrapped out some wins last year but often suffered from being one no Cruz's aggro Lucio worked in goats until it didn't. Setting up angles for Soon's Widowmaker worked until it didn't. And with so much of the league upgrading like we've never seen before, I think Paris are being left in the dust. Tanks, Ben Best, and No Smite are average Overwatch League backups, in my opinion, but have yet to excel as starters. Gray on flex support was a pleasant surprise last year and may be a playmaker again, but what else do they got? Okay, pretty doom and gloom. Not much to see here, folks. Oh, wait, there's two more signings on the roster that can't play until the midseason because they're underage. Well, who are they? Sparkle and Hanbin come from one of the most dominant South Korean contenders teams ever, Element Mystic. If you think back to last year, both the Titans and the Dragons saw major success bringing in top talent from Korea, or even earlier, London from Season 1. We know this is a recipe for success. Only problem is, it's only two players. Sparkle's sensational Doomfist only can go so far, and really, I fail to see how these Koreans can change the mentality in the locker room for this team. A few studs won't change the atmosphere of being a marketable European team, and as well, these additions come into the season in too late to dig Paris out of the hole I expect them to be in by that point but they likely jump a tier in power when they settle in properly but I expect that will take effect next season when they build around the element mystic core rather than hope the band-aid solves everything now the bright spot for this team is the veteran experience from the likes of soon who's proven to be resourceful and crafty for years in competitive overwatch but soon will need a big year in both performance and leadership for paris to make play-ins number 17 the la valiants the Valiant have cleaned house, and now their roster is a mix of mid-season signings of last year and new contenders signings. Due to many analysts rating this green roster very low thus far, many players and coaches have tweeted that Valiant have been overperforming this assumed low power level in preseason scrims. Many citing that the XL2 Academy players gig on main tank and KSP on damage have been shining. And it's not like last year's late additions performed poorly either, with KSF stepping up after a weak season one and Shax, who was crucial in Valiant's swing back late last year, and then they add another solid DPS and apply, the Valiant should be ready for hero pool rotations in their DPS line, but their support backline is fairly unaccomplished. New pickups Lastro and Rain have had average results in Korean contenders, but I think we found in the Overwatch League thus far, unless you've dominated in Tier 2, players often aren't ready for the step up to Tier 1 immediately. They also have McGravy, who had sparks of brilliance for Florida in Season 2, but is still a proven overall until this team proves they can handle playing on stage and manage the frantic pace of the tier one league i'm going to remain skeptical on their power 
Number 16, the Toronto Defiant. This team is basically the Overwatch League version of Team Canada. Their DPS line consists of Sure 4, Mangachu, Agilities, and Logics. Between those four, the Defiant will not have a problem starting a player on whatever DPS they want or need week to week when Hero Pool rotations come around. They got everything covered. However, none of them are necessarily elite players on multiple heroes or have struggled with consistency in the past. Also, this is an odd mix of players as they have far too much hero overlap for my liking, with little power difference between them. It reminds me of the Taimu AKM problem in Dallas from last year, but for flex DPS in this case. And their biggest weakness in my eyes is their tank line. Nevix finally escapes from bench prison and will get a start as off tank and be solid, I'm sure. He's a veteran player who's played all three roles in his long career, but Beast is a main tank that I honestly think was always the most shaky part of the longtime dominant NA contenders team, Fusion University. Even when they stomped the competition, Beast looked exploitable and sometimes outright sloppy. There's a chance those mistakes are coachable and he gets an upgrade and, well, Defiant desperately needs that to happen as they have no backup currently. Main support, Kellex has been a powerful support at times, looked like an easy focus fire target at others, and flex support, Kareev, is skillful across many heroes for sure, and I expect him to make some big plays, but perhaps not the dominant season fans hoped to see from him. Number 15, Florida Mayhem. Florida looks less apathetic this year, bringing a colorful rebrand as well as signing former Runaway DPS, Yaki, and support Gangnam Jim. Remember, Runaway has produced a hilarious amount of Korean talent in Overwatch. First, the Vancouver roster that took second last year came from that organization, one Korean contenders before getting signed into OWL, then Runaway scouted and signed an entirely new roster that won contenders again. That kind of thing really is unheard of. These players are no joke, and when you start to combine the veteran experience of the likes of Fate and Saya player, you start to piece together that this roster can go somewhere. Only problem is, the league is upgrading all around them, and well, I have yet to find a reason to put much faith in this team's management. There's more hidden gems on this roster, but also a few duds I would have liked to see let go to put them any higher. Chris and BQB looked weak last year and seemingly need specific heroes to be meta to succeed, and Saya can only do so much. Gargoyle seriously popped off on Hog last year, but I'm not sold on his teamwork-based tanks quite yet. Florida has enough talent to make plays in some entertaining games, but perhaps not enough to win consistently to escape the lower third of the league. Now we're going to move on to the next tier. This is the start of B tier. And last year, there was a huge chunk of the league that floated among what I would consider B tier with only a few wins separating them. For this reason, I've split the B tier into two categories with the lower section being teams that are on the fringe or bubble of making or missing the play in tournament cutoff off at 12th place. Number 14, the Washington Justice. Washington was an exciting team to watch last year as they attempted to escape the basement through sheer force of will of their DPS carries, Corey and Stratus, once they were released from Goat's prison, of course. My issue is I'm not so sure the personality of this team has changed. They dropped Janice and signed a major upgrade in Roar from the Gladiators, but Roar didn't actually meet my expectations last year, so I remain skeptical on how that's going to work out. The rest of the roster looks solid on paper, but maybe questionable in practice. Aim God has had serious drama when on Boston, but his aim is in fact godly, so maybe there's no problems to be had if heads are getting clicked and wins come. Ark was a serious upgrade to this team when he came in for main support. He's a star talent for sure, but Swedish tank players Elivo and Lullish are huge question marks coming in as rookies with little high level play experience. New signing Tuba comes in from tier two Korea and from what I've seen likely is an upgrade over Stratus but overall I think it remains to be seen if this is an actual team or a selection of players that can pop off sometimes in a meta they like. Don't get me wrong mechanical skill matters a ton now that you can't hide behind pure teamwork playstyles like last year but still I'm skeptical this team can win tough games against a powered up league. They may in fact rely too much on harder less reliable frag centered playstyles even when they're not optimal and that can be extremely boom or bust number 13 the la gladiators 
The Gladiators made a lot of roster moves in the offseason. They signed main tank OGE from the Fuel, off tank Space from the Valiant, hit scan DPS Bird Ring from London, Mirror, who is a nutty flex DPS from NA Contenders, tier 2 veterans like DPS Jaru and main support Paintbrush finally get into the league, and they re-signed Bishu on off tank. These signings don't have me too excited though, even the veterans. OGE perhaps suffered from the Dallas Fuel Effect last year, a team in shambles, making him look worse, but I think it's more likely he just struggles with performance on stage. He was quite skittish last year and didn't meet the expectations I had of him watching him clown on people in ranked. Luckily though, they have LH Cloudy, who was a dominant EU contenders tank that can likely come in if needed, but Bird Ring 2, possibly one of the flakiest performers we've ever seen. Maybe a good backup on a roster, sure, but he's their hit scan. Not a gamble I want to take week in and week out. Space, as well, is a player who benched himself on Valiant, and yes, was a dominant D.Va player at one time, but he too had a very weak performance in the playoffs year one for the Valiant. This trend starts to stack up for me, and I assume Coach Dipe is confident he can turn it all around, but I can't ignore it. I'm a big fan of Mirror. I think he's really talented and almost everyone is high on Shaz and Big Goose in the support backline. But from what I'm sitting, last year's GOATS meta was an opportunity for those supports to really pop off and they didn't shine for me. They're fine. They have a very safe and formulaic style that won't lose you the game. But I think they're a bit overrated compared to the other monsters on these positions elsewhere in the league. This placing would be a massive drop in the standings for Gladiators and one I may be really wrong about, but as I'm sure the organization expects far more of itself having made the playoffs the last two years, but I fear this is the wrong type of roster to bring into a hectic performance-based hero pool format. Number 12, the Dallas Fuel. Dallas, like many disappointing teams from last year, seems to be getting its act together. Taimu always had an awkward overlap with AKM and decided to step down to tier two for now. Mickey has moved to content creator, and Dallas fleshed out their roster with some big signings. Gamsu was acquired from the Dragons to pair with Note again, which is good. The two of them had consistent play both together and apart since they've bounced around the league for the last two years. Perhaps the two of them are not all stars on all the heroes in their roles, but stable for sure. DPS was a weakness for this team for years now and has seemingly been solved with two huge pickups. Decay comes in over from the Gladiators, and although he barely had a chance to show off his main heroes in the GOATS era. What we did see from him last year didn't disappoint me, and alongside him, Doha was acquired from the top Korean contenders team, Element Mystic. Doha is a scary damage dealer, but I'd actually expect AKM to compete well for this spot in the hero pool world. Remember, he played on Rogue back in the day in a style that was all about individual playmaking. Hero pools may bring us back to that. Speaking of Rogue, Unko never felt like a weak spot for me on this team. He played about as well as I ever could expect from him with the team crumbling around him more times than not. But as well, flex support is bolstered now with the addition of Crimzo, who's been a nutty Canadian head-clicking support for the longest. Crimzo has played with Team Canada, and Jane has always raved about him. Seems like nepotism to me. Just kidding, don't at me. Unlike the first two years, it finally seems like Dallas is playing with a full deck of cards, something that will be vitally important with hero pools coming into the mix. But I'm remaining pretty cautiously low on them for now, because even if we think they have have the talent, the Fuel could still mismanage this roster like they've fumbled in the past. Number 11, the Houston Outlaws. Houston had a painful season two as they were going through an ownership change and had no budget for players or even a necessary amount of coaches. They've looked to rectify this, signing loads of staff, including now head coach Harsha, who comes hot off success with Vancouver last year. The roster saw major buffs as well, acquiring the top five NYXL off tank Mecco, whose defensive style likely fits right into Houston seamlessly. And they got Jexay from Seoul, who had a rather successful season with the Dynasty last year and was famous for shot calling, which is an area Houston badly needs replacing now that Jake has left the team to pursue casting for the league. Coming along with Harsha from Vancouver is Repel who was a flex support backup for the almighty Twilight, but here we'll flesh out where Raucous's hero pool lacks. More additions, Houston acquire Blase from Boston and Hydration from the Gladiators, who cover the loss of Jake's hero pool, but don't necessarily 
increase the team's power in this area too much, I think. They still got Lynxer, their Widow Specialist, and their star player, Dante. And with all things considered, I feel like we've seen this type of roster succeed in Owl already. A stack of fundamentally sound roles in tank and support with flexible, if perhaps not elite DPS. I'm confident the Outlaws can leave the basement of Overwatch League this year and be in reach of the play-ins. There's too many veterans with proven experience and results for me to think otherwise. And the way I see it panning out, they likely will be the type of team that doesn't jump out as an obvious playoff threat but yet stays sound for the majority of the year farming up wins on weaker teams holding their position in the standings but perhaps would also fall reliably to the higher tier teams possibly a good gatekeeper for the next tier and now we move on to what I'll call the B tier proper it's moving up like half a tier these are the teams that I expect at least to make play-ins number 10 Soul Dynasty Soul is a tough one as I've seen them ranked much higher, but I think their off-season moves were quite the gamble. Soul has picked up some of the best aspects of the Season 1 Championship team. Bedozen, who was only behind Jonek, Year 1 on flex support. Prophet, who many would call the best player in the league as he plays almost all the DPS bar range hit scan to a dominant level. And Gesture, who although has had a shaky Reinhardt at times, has devastating Orisa halts and one of the best Winstons in the league. The problem I have is I have no idea how the personality of that London core will mix with the Soul management. Soul last year did all sorts of wacky roster shuffles and always looked to be trying to craft some sort of mad scientist approach to playing Overwatch. Often it worked, oddly enough. It worked so well that their backup main tank, Marvel, outperformed the legendary tank Fissure and took over the starting spot. Marvel was so consistent, there's a chance that he even gets the majority of playtime over the championship winner gesture. But the real problem with all of this is... Soul runs that very particular system, and these ex-London players were famous for a very laissez-faire attitude, one that evidently forced out multiple coaches from London over the last two years. And on Soul's end, their wonky style perhaps was what drove Fissure off the team last year to begin with. Will these two elements even mix without imploding? I don't know. Not to mention, Soul lost Jexe, Ryu Jaehong, and Fleta. All were solid performers for them in the past. So overall, I'm not so sure Soul has upgraded here, but perhaps traded old problems for new. Like one-to-one -one comparisons, their new players are probably better than their old ones, but the rest of the league is upgrading too. And it's a team game after all. You got to get these guys to play as a team. And if I have doubts about that, well, it's hard for me to put them a whole lot higher. They still have Fitz and Illicit on DPS, Michelle on off tank, and Toby on main support, all of which I think are solid, but none of them show to be particularly elite. I need to see the shot calling and play style of this team show some consistency on this new roster before I'll believe they'll go above this ranking. I don't know if they have enough talent on DPS, despite having bird flipping profit and otherwise in their trades accomplished maybe too many side grades which may lose pace with the rest of the league who have upgraded overall if they make this work they can jump a tier but i feel safer putting them here slightly below where they finished last year number nine the hongzhou spark the spark are a team that i feel i'm perpetually underrating they never looked convincing to me last year yet they took fourth place with 18 wins so am i wrong well i think this is actually a very well coached team with a decent level of talent but I think they sort of lucked out with being a very stable team that could get reliable wins all year, but never truly were as close to the teams near them in the standings as their record would suggest. They were a sound GOATS team with one of the best main tanks in the league in Gushue, who didn't necessarily pop off himself, but I feel made everyone else looked better with very disciplined play, perhaps comparable to the playstyle of Super on Shock with how they both play Reinhardt. The team signs more Chinese players, Mika and Coldest. The latter, I think, will be an upgrade over Bebe, their support player. And their DPS were always fine. Godsby is a Korean veteran and will do most of the heavy lifting for the team, but Adora and Bazi were just fine when they had to play actual DPS heroes. But I think they'll properly get tested this year with hero pulls and more likely fail against some of the superstars of this league. IDK on main support and Rhea on off tank were very big playmakers last year. And when you have that kind of powerful tank and support line combo, it's tough to imagine this team dropping any lower no matter what. And come to think of it, I'd give that core a big percentage of the credit for last year's success. 
able to get a lot more out of their DPS with team play than they would have on a lesser team. But I just don't think their peak as a team is high enough to go much higher in power though. Number eight, the Guangzhou Charge. The Charge are basically the polar opposites of the Spark. Where the spark have solid fundamentals to win most of the games they should all last year the charge seemed to want to throw away wins even when they displayed hilarious amounts of skill their skill ceiling is higher but i easily see them dropping lower to be replaced by a much more consistent team it's crazy to look at their roster because they have some of the most talented players they're like a washington with more depth happy is a remarkable hit scan Shu just farms on flex support. Nero has had some dominant moments on flex DPS, and Eileen can and will pick up the slack if there is any in that department. These guys are kind of nuts, but their tank line consisting of Rio from last year and Hoppa's replacement, Krong, who comes from Korean contenders, are big question marks for me. Krong is highly rated, but I thought Rio was a bit boomer bust. Luckily, the charge signed Neptuno, who should be a massive upgrade over Chara, who I thought looked lost a lot of the time last year. Maybe that alone is enough to secure stability in this team, but at this point, I'm more confident the charge squandered this talent than utilize it. However, I will say there's a chance that if Overwatch plays far messier than we remember, with hero pools the charge may perform better as that's the chaotic gameplay they seem to always want to bring out anyway for the better part of last year number seven the Chengdu hunters wow this is a high placing for them isn't it this one's gonna be some fun Chengdu was a serious fan favorite from last year for their bold commitment to play off meta it didn't really work but it sure did put on a show whereas the previous two Chinese orgs had either teamwork or peak performance problems for me Chengdu has shown us a model that I think translates to the hero pool format quite well first of all I think you need an elite flex DPS got it Jinmu is the real deal and has a very underrated Yvetol attached to him half the time as one of the most skilled mercies in the league or perhaps just a great player for this team a lot of the roster feels that way to me where I'm not sure how players like Yvetol Yvetol, Amang, and Elsa would perform on other rosters, but Chengdu has an odd offbeat pace they play in that complements each other rather well when it works. And yes, it didn't actually work all that much last year, but they were swimming upstream against the meta for the majority of the year, and hero pools may be their time to shine. My opinions on this team have been drastically affected by the Chinese Overwatch expert Volamel, who thinks their new signings are legit. I don't know who these players are, but if either Molly or Lengsa are indeed an upgrade on Kyo, I think they've got their core down. And really, the only major weakness from last year I saw was Hitscan DPS. They didn't have a serious carry in that role, and coming in on his white horse to save the day is the best Chinese hitscan player in the world that we know of anyway who finally came of age leave leave is so good Volumel takes him as a potential rookie of the year candidate and while I don't know about that Chengdu will finally have a guy opposite a Jinmu at a similar power level this will be a very revealing year for the hunters was the play we saw last year biased towards being able to be the one chaos team that caught teams out because they were hard to prepare for how will they stack up when all the league has to play more like that my bet is that this team has a solid start in the chaos format before the other teams catch up and perhaps do even more than that, bringing firepower and speed that many other teams struggle to keep up with. The downside for them might be with regional based play, teams that repeatedly play the Hunters won't be tripped up, but instead grow used to their style. But with any luck, the Hunters are in fact good enough to not need the surprise factor alone to win. Now moving up one more tier and we've got only six teams left. And I thought that these rosters were so strong that I only could put one team in a tier and the rest are competing in s which brings us to number six shanghai dragons we know that shanghai dragons dps have an insane peak stage three of last year was a remarkable test of their abilities the only problem was diem and ding look elite on their best heroes but they're not very flexible to rectify this the dragons pick up the flex dps fleta from seoul and longtime strong contenders korea dps lip from the team blossom I am worried about their tank line though. They lost the stable rock of a tank in Gamsu to Dallas and have reacquired Fearless, who was one of the sacrificial lambs that originally was a mid-season pickup year one during the 0-40 Dragons run. He did actually make some plays back then, but it's really hard to judge when on such a bad roster. They also got Stand One, who's a tank I don't know anything about, 
and acquired Void from the Gladiators, who was an off-tank that was known for stellar D.Va play before coming into Owl, but I always felt looked a bit sluggish and unimpressive on the Gladiators. Perhaps that was just the byproduct of odd tank play from their main tanks at the time, and we'll see Void return to form, but I feel we haven't seen him shine yet. Fearless, despite contributing to the 0-40 loss streak on the Dragon's Year 1, might actually be more similar in power level to Gamsu, and there's nothing to worry about. I feel safe in saying mechanically that probably is the case, but let's just hope his decision-making is as sound, and he can play as stable as Gamsu did. On flex support, they have Luffy, who did just fine, made some huge plays, I thought, but was eventually benched by a higher tier flex support in Izaki, who is a mechanical powerhouse, so the dragons are set in that department, and they got a very strong replacement at main support in Lee J Gon, who came from the renowned contenders Korea team Runaway. I don't know if Lee J Gon is known as as a shot caller, but with only one main support, I'm gambling that the dragons are confident in his ability to perform in tier one, and really we should as well. He's X runaway after all. There's enough question marks for the dragons that I could see them drop to a play-in team, but I think they have enough peak talent to not drop much further. I see them having the potential to hold their place, but I think a lot of their power points are just a bit less certain. And judging by how last year they needed certain heroes to line up for them to be ultra competitive, I'm a little worried that happens again. They got more players now to protect themselves from that, but I still think it's probably an issue. Going into the last tier now, into the S tier. These are teams that I think have the talent to win the whole league. Number five, the Philadelphia Fusion. Do you remember year one Philly, the team that popped off on their way to the grand final, seemingly with aim alone. Season one Philly was led by their DPS duo EQO and Carpe, players whose peaks and depth were great when actual DPS were played, but the additions to this roster are just an embarrassment of riches. They now have Ivy, who was on the Defiant last year, but I thought never really got a chance to fully shine, but even then, there are parts where he honestly was carrying that team, and at worst, he'll be a backup to EQO if not take his starting spot, as he might be a bit better mechanically and play more heroes, honestly. They have Chipsa on the bench in case they need a Doomfist ever, but that probably won't be the the case to be honest but anyway more importantly is their massive upgrades in the off tank and flex support departments from london philly stole away fury who many would argue is the best off tank in the league it's close between him and choi but in any case Fury's mechanics are seriously godlike, and on a team that's all about aggressive play he certainly will be a welcome addition and on flex support Philly joins the likes of other elite teams that have insane aimers at this position. Shock, Titans, and NYXL have Violet, Twilight, and Jonak, respectively. Well, now, Philly has their own, named Alarm, who was famous for being the other massive carry player on the Fusion University Dominance era in NA Tier 2 prior to GOATS. This guy was called the second coming of Jonak back then, and I have no reason to doubt it now. He's so good that I think he's a likely candidate for Rookie of the Year. So Philly's bringing some heat this year. But the only problem is Sato is still their sole main tank, which feels troublesome as he's never really put up the performances that would suggest he belongs on this caliber of a team or at the very least without a backup. But the team has faith in him evidently. I mean, he's mechanically strong, but his decision making seems to struggle at times. And last year, they looked like they had to favor Winston Goats due to his weakness on Reinhardt, even when Rein was the meta. And these aren't the types of Achilles heels you want in your championship bound roster. It might not matter though. Philly may just have too many headhunters at every role and will dominate teams with aim, at least when rush comps aren't dominating the hero pool. But one last pickup that may save Philly if rush comps are too required in the meta is main support Funny Astro, who was a beastly tier two Lucio player that made a name for himself carrying in the GOATS meta when Lucio's ran free to manipulate team fights as they saw fit. There's a chance that such a proficient rushdown comp player as Funny Astro covers up any weaknesses the team has playing the comp, but just in case they can't play full FPS deathmatch all year for whatever reason, I'm putting them slightly below teams that have more stable cores and wider playstyles. Number four, the Atlanta Reign. Now you may be surprised to see Atlanta this high due to how up and down their season was, but if you look at stage 
stage four in the playoffs, I think you'll have a better picture of their strengths. After a dominant stage four led by the flex DPS power of Erster, Atlanta was the only team to beat Shock and send them into the loser's bracket in the playoffs. And that alone might warrant them ranking in the upper quarter of teams and making the playoffs. But the superpowered additions to this team are what put them in contention of a championship. Coming in on off tank is Hawk, an NA player I've had the opportunity to watch come up from the open division and stomp his way all the way through contenders and now land himself on a very competitive Overwatch League roster. What makes Hawk so insane is yes, his mechanics are great, but he always has a knack for playmaking. It's the kind of thing that's hard to describe. In sports, it's called a nose for the ball, implying that a player can just sniff out where the opportunities are and exploit them. That's Hawk in a nutshell. The kid just reads the game so well that it looks like he's two steps ahead. And he'll combine with Gator, with pre-established synergy as the two just played on the Atlanta Academy team before this year. Next up are the new DPS. They acquire Sharp, who was always a consistent performer for Team Envy and Contenders. But the next one will absolutely knock your socks off. It's Edison. Edison has put up some of the most outrageous hitscan gameplay in Korean contenders I've ever seen. The guy's aggression and speed reminds of peak Carpe. Yes, he's that good. I'd say Rookie of the Year candidate, but I think he might be more of a rotation player, and I doubt Widow will be meta long enough to really have him shine, but... That's the caliber of player I think he is. On the bench, they have Baby Bay, who will likely sub in, but that will matter now that subs actually do a lot to rest your star players when travel gets overwhelming. And Baby Bay was a solid performer last year. Not elite, but a workhorse for sure. And in the back line, they have Masa on main support, who I don't think gets the acclaim he deserves, and Dogman or Kodak on flex support, which maybe aren't at the height as some of the other flex supports in this tier, but not too far off either. And especially when I consider the power level of the rest of the roster, I don't knock them down for this. Dogman can put up some numbers too. Number three, the Vancouver Titans. Vancouver has had a radical offseason, one that has been largely received very poorly by critics. The Titans dropped both their main tanks, Bumper and Tizzy, from last year and replaced them with Fissure with no backups. This looks like a huge gamble on paper, but I'm not as afraid as everyone else seems. Yes, benching yourself in the playoffs due to squabbles internally like he did in LA is problematic behavior, but the other instances of instability I don't think are as telling as people make them seem. He left London when he didn't get playtime. Who can blame him? A lot of other people left too. Then he, quote, retired from Seoul when Marvel took his job, but really, was that just more of a meta that didn't fit his playstyle, and also Soul running a system that didn't jive with his strengths. I think Fissure had one look at Bumper's play in Season 1 with the incredible S-tier backline of Slime and Twilight and said, sign me up, I can do all that and more. I don't think it's debatable. These are the best supports Fissure's ever played with. And yes, if he does leave the season early here, everyone else was right and I was wrong. He's a problematic player who's unreliable, but I think he's gonna be having too much fun farming people to even consider that. Between Fissure, the off-tank stable Janu, Slime on main support, and Violet on flex, that might be the strongest core of any roster in the league. Sure, Fissure was average in GOATS, but he was sensational in the dive era. I think Fissure's style works both with the kind of game Overwatch is transforming back into, as well as synergy with Slime and Twilight, who, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it, I think are the number one backline in the league bar none. The pace of their adaptation and outplay smothers lesser teams, and I feel Fissure will replicate what Bumper did just better. My only real concern is the DPS on this team. Axel is a very strong veteran, but has come from kind of a bygone era. He's extremely good at set execution plays with his team, like coordinating around Doomfist engages or Nanoblades, comboing with his other teammates to get maximum value out of them, of which I think both he could do in his sleep at this point due to how many years of experience he has executing these plays, but I don't think his pool's very deep, and that may box the Titans in more than they'd like. Perhaps that doesn't matter, though, when the rest of the team just rolls over people, and Stitch, I think, is a bigger weak point 
who as a hit scan has a bit too inconsistent of aim for my liking if he's asked to play intense skill shots like Widow, though he'll be good on most other things. So Min Su has proven to be a dominant specialist when the time comes, but it remains to be seen if that is the type of heroes that are even going to be competitive options in the hero pools format. And lastly, Real J Hong was signed to this team for whatever reason. There's almost no world where RJH should start, but like Repel did before him, may get some sub in games on the road to rest the all-star when the schedule is a little light, which is bound to happen when you're probably going to be much, much better than most teams yet again. Moving on to number two, the NYXL. People seem to sleep on the NYXL, yet they've had the most successful two seasons outside of winning the finals, and last year got one game away from the big dance. NYXL saw departures of Mecco, Flower, and Pine, and didn't go too crazy with signings, only getting three in return, capping out their roster at nine players total. And they picked up Bianca at off tank, a consistent performer in their NA Contenders Academy team, XL2, but also picked up Hotba, who's a league veteran. Of course, Mecco likely was still the better player, but judging how their old head coach Pavane has moved on, and we've already started to see a change in coaching philosophy near the playoffs last year. Collecting all this evidence, it looks like NYXL may be heading towards a far more aggressive team play style than we expect of them. By playoffs last year, they developed a far more active style than reactive, willing to go for coordinated set attacks and comps that other teams wouldn't even try, and that boldness got them to the semifinal. Mecco's great, sure, but he was always a defensive player, and what we know we can expect from Hotba is some aggressive, mechanically-based play. Hotba frags, man. He did on Fusion, and he did on Charge. Sure, he's nowhere near as clean of a player as Mecco was, but sometimes you have to be willing to take big risks to make big plays, which is exactly the change NYXL needs to get over the playoff hurdle that's been blocking them from getting their own championship. Perfect play will far up regular season wins, but big plays are what wins in the postseason. But if it was just that change, I wouldn't put them in second. Sure, Nene is a rockstar DPS and SBB is a great leader, but I always thought Libero lacked a bit of firepower in big games, especially on some of the hardest flex DPS heroes, which is part of the reason why NYXL had a personality of playing safer and more defensive. Mecco was part of that, but I thought Libero was as well, who's good at playing smart and safe, but has struggled when he had to get a little too aggressive or pick up the pace. Well, you can throw all that out the window because NYXL picked up who I think is the single greatest Genji player I've ever seen. It's Who Are You? Who Are You has been too young to join the Overwatch League for the past few years. It's been painful waiting for Who Are You to be of age to join the Overwatch League. You have no idea what you've missed if you haven't watched any pro Overwatch prior to the Overwatch League. Sure. Who Are You has had toxicity problems way in the past. He was part of the dominant Lunatic High roster that was winning everything in Korea before OWL started, but due to his attitude, they kicked him off the team and they won the championship anyway. Probably angered by this, Who Are You went overseas to NA Contenders and led the Fusion University to a reign of dominance unlike any other team we've ever seen. How good I think Who Are You is, is hard to describe. Listen, I know we've described a lot of players as seriously elite before, even in this video. But to me, the quality of control that Who Are You has on his best characters is unlike anything I've seen any other player attempt. He's the most clutch, most mechanically capable player I've ever seen. I've watched him pull off maneuvers that nobody even attempts, much less pulls off. He's famous for routinely using Genji to do a far as midair and makes it look easy. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. His hero pool might not be the deepest, as he seems to need to play heroes with a high skill cap because he's sort of the opposite of Libero, who likes to play safe and smart. Who are you needs to be set up to clutch and pop off, or else he starts to look kind of average. But in a hero pool world, undoubtedly we'll find ourselves in spots where who are you has a chance to do exactly that. NYXL has a chance to take it all this year. And for my money, who are you is my rookie of the year candidate. And I haven't even mentioned the year one MVP still plays for this team, doesn't he? It's easy to forget that Jonak was popping off in GOATS 2. He just didn't have as many squishy heroes in the meta to utterly outplay like he did in year one. But with hero pools, I think this bloodthirsty support is going to establish his dominance yet again. Oh, and Mano is the single best main tank in the league. 
when you account for all the main tank heroes. You can play them all. Whereas other teams will need a rotation to play all the main tanks. I think NYXL will be able to seamlessly swap strats without substitutes, which is an asset not every other team will have. And last up in the number one spot is the San Francisco Shock. Shock just got off a complete season of domination, but that was in a MOBA format and that gameplay is largely dead this year. Can the shock adjust? Well, the truth is at this point, I feel there's nothing Coach Krusty can't do. He's upgraded every player he's ever coached, it seems. Of all the players on the shock, last year was their best performance years ever. It's not like Krusty came in, took over a championship squad, no. His influence looks massive across the board as well. Rascal was a tech DPS player way back in Apex, then got outshined by Profit in London. Then he has what could be an MVP year for the shock all the way to the grand final. Radical improvement. Super, sure, had a great aggro Ryan early in his career in quad tank meta in NA, but year one Overwatch League, he was shaky in dive. Then in GOATS, he was the most stable tank in the game, even while most of the resources went into their carry player, Sinatra, who, as well, didn't meet expectations until Krusty took over. A meta change came in late last year, Double Shield was the new hotness, and their all-star tank player looked very weak on Sigma to start, which contributed to them dropping into the lower bracket. Oh, what's that? Best staff in the league, you say? They fix their mistakes internally and then go on a devastating lower bracket run all the way through the grand finals where Choyobin literally becomes the best Sigma in the league and plays flawlessly to enable their annoying Bastion comps. Night and day difference from zero to hero. Yes, Choi is an insane off tank, but the crusty effect just is everywhere. This team can't lose, it seems. So listen, I'm not actually that high on these players. I still find faults in, I think their hero pools will be tested with the new format, but at this point, I have to give Krusty the benefit of the doubt that he'll just fix any problem that comes up. I think it's more likely that they'll drop lower in the standings, but will still make playoffs. But I'm just going to take the coward's way out and leave them as number one, because even if I poke holes in their roster power, I think Krusty will just correct them anyway, or draw up some corny rushdown comp that they'll drill to perfection and be unbeatable on that. But to not go out on such a bad note, I will go over the weaknesses I think Shock can have exploited this year. Mainly, I think they got exposed in Stage 3 versus the Dragons in the Stage Playoffs. Granted, the Shock didn't have much prep time and perhaps didn't even prioritize the Stage Playoffs as it doesn't really have consequences bar a monetary bonus. But when the Shock had to match the Dragons head-to-head -head on more traditional FPS heroes rather than the MOBA-esque damage picks, they lost. I think Striker is not an Elite Widow, which I often think can be required in the Overwatch League at this level. Architect's better on the pick than he is, and he's your flex DPS. He's not your hit scan carry. He can't play everything for you. Last year, Sinatra looked incredibly talented, but I don't really know where his hero pool is right now in this format or what he'll even be able to play. I'd imagine he can play the best tracer on the team by now, but I'm not sure what else will be relevant. Rascal was always a fun player to watch because he specialized on heroes like Mei, who when she was far weaker, but playable. Then the devs made her OP and Rascal ate up free wins with a spoon. But if we get away from these MOBA style DPS, does Rascal return to the power level I remember him being? I don't know. It feels like these are all question marks we've seen this team dominate on may reaper bastion and goats but this year will almost certainly be mostly not that and i think there's a chance they come back down to earth and the stronger competition might outclass them i think it's safe to say they'll dominate when teamwork reliant rush comps are in the pool as will be early in the year but i'm not confident in their fragging comps until i see it happen super struggled as winston in dive and i don't know what smurf can play actually but even with all my naysaying i wouldn't predict them to miss a guaranteed playoff spot with how sound their core is Troyobin, Moth, and Violet are probably all you need to guarantee playoffs, even if there are in fact troubles elsewhere. But only time will tell. That's why they play the games. And I'm hyped to see this season pan out. Gonna be a lot of craziness, a far more complete Overwatch viewing experience rather than the same mirror meta for six months, which undoubtedly is going to be 
a better test, I think, of these teams, as well as a far more interesting viewing experience. Guys, that's everything for today's video. I hope you did enjoy the video, and if you did, please be sure to leave it a like. It really does help us out. Let's know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos go live. Link to the description is our Twitter, where we tweet out news, updates, and dank memes. That's been it for me. I've been Frito. For your Overwatch, we'll see you guys next time.